Okay. Welcome everyone to Mind Garden. Down's going to talk to us about about uh, special relativity, not general. So it's the easy stuff we're going to be talking about. It's special relativity, and um, and the brain's going to talk to us about Kubernetes, which is more complex than relativity. So. Go ahead, Donald. It's true. Okay, so yeah, I'm going to talk about special relativity. I listened to about like 15 hours this lecture on relativity. I listened to it about four or five times. Every time it's more interesting, and I think I learned the much the most just preparing this. So um, I'm trying to compress this down into 30 minutes. So just think of that. But um, it, yeah, like Kirby said, it's actually one of the easier things to understand. So first off, what is relativity? Well, relatively simply asserts that everyone experiences the same laws of physics regardless of their location, if they're on Earth in a spaceship or in the galaxy Andromeda, and regardless of your station of motion or, how, or state of motion or how fast you're moving. Physics operates the same for everyone in those circumstances. So you already know this. When you're on a, a cruise ship, if you're playing tennis on a cruise ship, you don't have to think, I'm going in the direction of the cruise ship, it's going 60 knots. When I hit this ball, I have to like account for that and hit it softer or harder. And if I'm aiming facing the other direction, I'm going to have to do the opposite. You don't have to think about that. Um, when you're on a plane eating peanuts, you're not worried that when you let go of that peanut, it's going to fly through the back of your skull at 600 miles an hour. <laughs> like, you already kind of understand this, the relativity. Um, if you put, we're warming up tea in a microwave on a cruise ship, or on a spaceship traveling really fast, you don't have to worry that like, the waves are going to fly against the side of the microwave and your tea is just going to stay cold. So you, you already understand relativity. Um, what you understand is that Earth is not a special place in the universe. Okay? If you, for the people, we, we, Hubble Telescope has seen galaxies that are traveling 80% of the speed of light away from Earth, in our perspective. The people that are playing tennis in, the, in that galaxy, they're not thinking, oh my gosh, Earth is traveling so far away, I've, this tennis ball is going to go like flying, right? They don't think that. So that's relativity. It doesn't matter who you are, physics operates the same. And that's, that's it. That's the end. Uh, however, <laughs> so that's relativity. However, this has implications that are not obvious to understand or easy to grasp and seem to run c counter to common sense because we don't see a lot of fast things that often. So now we'll explore some of them to understand those. But first, we kind of have to talk about motion and some history. Motion, it's all about motion. Without motion, nothing exists. Everything stops. Electrons don't move, voices don't carry, nothing happens. So what does it mean to move? So moving is really important. What does it mean to move? It means to move from space to space through space it also takes time to move. There is no such thing as instantaneous motion. If we understand motion, we have a clue to the nature of space and time. First, we need a little history lesson, though, to really help ingrain this in us. Okay, um, Aristotle, 320 BC, they used to think the Earth was a special place. Everything revolved around the Earth. Then Copernicus came around in the 1500s and said, no, uh, Earth travels around the sun. The Earth is not a special place. Galileo came along and said, wow, I see moons of Jupiter. Earth really isn't a special place. And also, I believe that, like, oh, the, uh, items, objects, natural state of rest, people used to think, or thought it was at rest as close to the center of the Earth as possible. Galileo said, no, if I roll a ball, it's going to go forever, as long as there's no air resistance or friction. And the natural state of an object, it, uh, state of motion is a straight line and going on forever. The question is not, why is the ball moving? The question is, what started it moving? Or what might make it stop? But not, why is it moving? That's normal. That's natural. Don't think that things aren't natural, not moving. Don't be a closet Aristotelian. Voyager, we sent that out in space 50 years ago, and it's been traveling in a straight line, same speed, for over 50 years. Then Newton came along. We know about his three laws of motion. He added upon what Galileo said. Um, we know about the story of the apple and gravity. He didn't discover gravity. Cavemen knew about gravity. But what he did know and realize is that the way the moon is orbiting and the, the apple falling, that those are the same thing. That both of those are falling towards Earth. The moon just happens to also be moving in a sideways direction. He had this thought experiment about if you had Earth and a really, you stood on a really tall mountain on top of Earth and you took a baseball, and you threw it, that of course it would fall. But if you threw it farther, it would go around a little bit further. And if you threw it really fast, it would go all the way around the Earth and he would catch that. And he, had that, he thought of that in the 1700s. And now we do that with satellites all the time. Um, he also invented calculus just to figure out how planets move. 
through, um, through the, this guy. And he also asked, and now the question comes up, who, he, he wrote these, the laws of motion. Well, who are these laws valid for? Who, for whom do these laws work? And he said, everyone. Everyone traveling in uniform motion. I'm going to use that word a lot, uniform motion. What is uniform motion? It's when an object's traveling in a straight line at a constant speed. Okay? That's uniform motion. Anytime you're doing that, laws of physics works. If you're going 600 miles an hour in a jet, you can do, you can do like this. You, know, you can play baseball. You can do whatever you want. And laws of physics work there. Or even if you're in the space station traveling you know, thousands, tens of thousands of miles. Okay. We also need to talk about electromagnetism a little bit, and it'll become clear why in a second. Um, we, we've known about magnetism and electricity for thousands of years. We know about the charges and how opposites attract. Um, you know about this. Um, scientists discovered that though when you create a magnetic, when you move a magnetic field, it actually creates an electric field. Magnetism and electric, electricity are different, but they have a relationship. When you create one, it move, it, when you move one, it creates another. And then when you move that one, it creates another. Well, Maxwell came along and said, um, what happens, this is kind of like circular dependencies here. Like, what happens, you know, like this could spiral out of control and leapfrog forward. And it probably does, and that would be then a wave. And that would be called an electromagnetic wave. Uh, that would be an electromagnetic wave. And he came up with some calculations and to four, four calculate formulas. Maxwell's equations, and he calculated the speed at which this electromagnetic wave would travel, and he calculated it as what we know and call now as the known speed of light. And at then, at then, it was immediately obvious that light is an electromagnetic wave. And in fact, radio waves, when you're talking about walkie-talkie, you turn your FM radio, uh, microwave waves, gamma rays, visible light, those are all electromagnetic waves, just different wavelengths. So light is an electromagnetic wave. Now, the question is, okay, well, for motion, that happens, anyone in uniform motion, the laws are the same. What about for electromagnetic? What about that branch of physics? Is that the same for all observers in uniform motion? Um, what that really, the same question is, is the speed of light the same for every observer? If it's true, then it's relative. If not, or then, it, then it's relativity. If not, then something else. So scientists at first thought, it's not. Okay, um, what are some answers? What is, what is speed C, what is the speed of light relative to? Well, the natural thing is the source. If I have a, if I have a flashlight and I turn on, it's going the speed of light up, right? And then, but then and if I run 20 miles an hour while holding it, is the speed of light now going speed of light plus 20 miles an hour? Well, they did a bunch of calculations and obviously and said, no, that's, that, uh, that is, that's, that's wrong, that's not how it works. Okay, well, what about, it's a wave, and we also know about sound waves and ocean waves, and those are relative to the medium that they travel through. Sound travels based on air, and if there's a wind going, sound moves faster, and if sound is going against the wind, it moves slower. Light must be the same thing. What is this medium called that light travels through? The ether. Okay. Um, now, there could be three things. One, Earth could be at rest in respect to the ether. The ether and the whole universe is traveling perfectly with Earth, and that's why light works the way it does on Earth. That's a, that's a terrible answer. I put an angry face there. Um, you should be angry because Earth is not a special place. You know this. Uh, they also did experiments, and that's not true. Maybe Earth drags the ether with it in its vicinity. They did experiments. That's not true. It's a whole lecture that I'm going to say is just not true. Um, maybe Earth moves with respect to ether. Maybe Earth travels through the ether in the universe. That makes sense. Let's explore that one. If we did, we would feel a wind. When you, if you're running outside through the air, you feel a wind. When, if light was going through the ether, there would be a wind. What happens in sound in a wind? It slows down and speeds up. Light should do the same. So Michelson and Morley created this apparatus that basically splits, splits lights in two directions, bounces it back, and then says, well, it, if it's going this direction, this direction is one going faster than the other, and if we turn it in degrees, does it change? And if we do it in the fall, and then we do it in the spring, when the Earth is going 40,000 miles in a different direction, does the light speed change go up or down? No, they found it does not. And they were confused. And everyone on the earth was confused. <laughs> <laughs> Until Einstein. Now we're getting into it. Okay, Einstein comes along in 1905. He's 26 years old. He's confused about this. He thought, if I run at the speed of light, and I, next to some light, do I just see like a frozen wave? Hmm. He also thought, what if I'm running and I hold a, a, a mirror in front of my face? And I run so fast as I approach the speed of light, 
maybe the light doesn't can't bounce off my face anymore, and I'm catching up to it. It can never reach the mirror, and maybe the mirror and the mirror does it just eventually turn black. And then he thought, you know what? This can't be. I have an answer. I know. I know what we haven't been thinking about. Time. That time is not the same for everyone. And so he wrote a paper called On the Electrodynamics of Special Bodies. So we call that special relativity. And he stated, ether is fiction. Ether is fiction. It doesn't exist. He said, relativity is not just true for motion, but it's true for all physics, even electromagnetism. And that's relativity. Okay. Just thinking, that's... <laughs> second <laughs> All right, here's where things get fun. Now we're going to get into some fun experiments to talk about what these effects are when we're moving fast at the speed of light. Imagine there's a train. This guy's on a train, and he's traveling half the speed of light. He looks down at his, the headlight going off the front of the train, and it's going the speed of light. And he's like, yeah, that's going the speed of light. Woman is on the station, and she's like, oh, this train's traveling half the speed of light towards me. Speed of light or the flashlight is also coming out off the, off the cover. At the top you see, is it half C plus C equals one and a half C? Is she seeing light approach her at one and a half C? Well, if you didn't believe in Einstein, that Einstein was right, you might think that's true. That's true. But exper uh, experiments and stuff say, no, that's not true. No. She sees it as C. What the heck? OK. Well, we know the equation. We know this equation that speed times time equals distance. Well, we know that we, we, if we believe relativity, then we know that speed cannot change. It's C all the time. Speed of light never changes. Then what can change? The only thing that can change then is time or distance. And both of those can change. When time changes, it's called time dilation. When distance changes, it's called length contraction. OK. This thing is called a light clock. And in case that drawing wasn't very good, I also built one. Um, that doesn't work, but it looks like it works. OK, imagine that there's a flashlight here at the bottom and a mirror here at the top, OK? And this whole light clock, so a clock is just anything that can measure an interval of time. If we shine a light here, and this is like the light, um, the photon of light, and it goes up, and it goes all the way up, and then it bounces off the top mirror, and then comes back down, that's like a clock. That's like a tick and a talk. That's going to take a certain amount of time, right? And then let's say we have like something here that senses that it came back and it fires another one. And it just goes back and forth. Tick, talk, tick, talk. Right? For those that uh, can't see me, um, there's a little uh, very bad uh, PowerPoint animation of it going up. And I didn't want to make it come down. It took too long. So do that. <laughs> OK. Now, you get what this is. And now I can look at this and I can say, OK, this is taking talking, maybe I'm humongous, I'm a giant size of Jupiter, and this is going like, it takes one second, or half a second to go up, half a second to go down. It's like, tick tock, tick tock, right? And that's fine for me. Now what if I'm moving sideways super fast while I do this? In your frame of reference, you're seeing it at the bottom, and then you're seeing it here, and then you're seeing it at the top, and then you're seeing it in the middle, and then you're seeing it at the bottom again. What you're seeing is this. You're seeing it at the bottom, then you're seeing it in the middle, then you're seeing it at the top, then you're seeing it in the middle, then you're seeing it at the bottom again. Or in other words, you're seeing a path of light that goes like this. Well, here's the deal. When you see light, we just said light travels at the speed of C no matter what, no matter who observes it. Well, that's a longer path, right? And so you know if that's traveling the same speed of C and it's taking a longer path, then it must take longer to get there. You just experienced time dilation. It took one second for the person, one, one. But when you counted, when you had your stopwatch, you're like, one, one and a half. That took one and a half seconds. The person's like, no, it took one second for me. It's time dilation. You just experience time differently. OK, here's a real life demonstration that shows, how, that shows this. This was a demonstration. They already believed in relativity. in the 1950s. Um, the scientists, they went to Mount Washington in New Hampshire, 6,000 feet high. Cosmic rays hit the atmosphere, and they break apart. And some of those particles that they create are muons. Muons then start to decay extremely rapidly. You may remember this from chemistry, but when they, do, they decay at a certain rate, okay, and that rate of decay is like a clock. So they, what they thought was, we'll go up to the top, we'll take like a Geiger counter or some, some kind of counter, and we'll see how many muons are hitting it um, every second. And they counted 600. 600 hitting a second. Well, they looked at the rate of decay in a book, or they could just look at the, they could count here, and they could figure out the rate of decay of muons. And they figured out, okay, they relate this, they decay at this certain rate. And we know that they're traveling in at 0.994 the speed of light. So that means in like a split second later, they're going to reach the bottom. And by then, most of them will have decayed. 
and there should only be 24 left. So they went down to the bottom of the, of the mountain, and they measured how many were left. But out of the 600, there were still 400 left. I'm like, what the heck? Well, they knew what was going on, relativity. They were traveling so fast that their time was dilated slower. They were experiencing one-ninth of the amount of time on their clocks that clocks on Earth were running. And when you plug one-ninth into the calculator, then exact 400 is exactly the amount of muons you'd expect to find at the bottom. Now you may be thinking, oh, so time dilation, when does time dilation happen? Time dilation happens for all objects moving in different frame of reference. A frame of reference means we're both sitting still, we're in the same frame of we're all in the same frame of reference in this, in, the, in this room right now. If someone was traveling by really fast on a plane, they're in a different frame of reference, right? They're on, it took, took, when they look out the window, everything's going by. They're in a different frame of reference. Anything that's moving in a different frame of reference in yourself is experiencing time dilation. Um, hey, walk in. My clock is now running slower than yours. Do you know that? My clock is running slower <laughs> than yours. It's so infinitesimal small that you don't notice it. What about on a plane where you're going really fast? Well, this is the formula for time dilation. And here's the graph it shows. You don't notice any change as you approach. Look, this is like 0.5 speed. This is, speed of light is 300,000 kilometers per hour. So a plane, a plane travels at one millionth, um, a tenth of a, a tenth, one ten thousandth of a percent of C. So in a plane, you're right here. You're not experiencing any difference. You start noticing differences down here. That's when you start noticing big time dilation differences, okay? Fun story. <laughs> Thought experiment. Star trip. Okay. Star you have a twin. You're 25 years old. You're in your twin. 25 years old. There is a planet. This is a planet 10 light years away. What does a light year mean? Light year is distance. It's the distance that it would take light to travel in 10 years relative to someone stationary. Okay? Your twin jumps on this spaceship and is going to travel at 80% the speed of C. Now, if they were traveling the speed of C, it would take them how long to get there? Ten years. Ten years. They're traveling slower than that. So it should take them longer to get there. Oh, good. You actually did the math. So yeah, we know this function. We saw it earlier. Speed was time equals distance. 8 point C um, at a distance of 10 CY light years. What is it? It's almost slow. It's 12.5. 12.5 years. So if we, our twin would go, we know it would take them 25, 12.5 uh, years to get there. And then they turn around and they come back and it's 12.5 years to get back. So we would have aged 25 years. We were 25 when they left, now we're 50. Our twin, using the time dilation calculation, they only experienced seven and a half years of flight. And they turned around and came back and experienced seven and a half years. Their, tri their trip was 15 years. When they land, they get out of the plane, you look at your twin, and they look 10 years younger. If we could travel at this speed of light, that's legit, that would happen. Um, okay, but what about the other way around? You might be thinking, and you're like, Maybe you're getting all this and you're like, well, hold on a sec. What if she, everything's relative? If she looks out the window of the starship and she just looks at the Earth, it looks like the Earth traveled away at 80% of the speed of light and then came back to her. So why isn't everyone on Earth 10 years younger than her? Any ideas? It's only, special relativity is when you're traveling in uniform motion, constant speed. She was, Earth people on Earth are traveling at constant speed. She was not. She stopped, turned around, came back. She felt a dramatic shift and acceleration and movement on her body. So it's not a symmetrical experience, it's asymmetrical. She did a completely different thing. Okay, now, and so what about traveling faster? We saw that chart there. Well, she, her trip took 15 years, but if she went a little bit faster, she could do it in 15 days. She could do it in 15 hours. She could do it in 15 seconds. Earth, you can't travel faster than the speed of light. So the fastest that someone could travel if we were on Earth would be 20 years, just over 20 years. To them, it would always look at least 20 years, but she can get her time on the spaceship down to milliseconds. The faster, the closer she approaches the speed of light. So you can travel into the future, you just can't go back. Oh, that was supposed to be the punchline to something else I was going to say. <laughs> <laughs> Andromeda, Andromeda is two million light years away. So how could we get there? We only live 100 years. How are we going to get there? You travel close to the speed of light, you can get there in a week. You can get there in a day. You can get there in a couple seconds. You need to turn around and you can come back in a couple seconds. But because it's 2 million light years away, every Earth will be at a minimum 4 million years older. Everyone will be dead. And it'll just be you. 
Now the punchline. You can travel into the future. <laughs> you just can't go back. One more thing. Let's look at her calculation. Her calculation is the same thing. She's traveling 8% sea of light. She can tell that by looking at where she's traveling to. But she only did it in seven and a half years. Uh, what, is this dis what does this mean then? Distance has to change here. It does. It ends up being six light years. The distance for her, when she was traveling, she's like, no, oh, it was only 10 light years. They were wrong on Earth. It was only six light years. I made this in six light years. It was only six light years. And in fact, when I looked at the planet, it looked kind of squashed. That's called length contraction. Now we're moving into when length changes, distance changes. Let's talk about length contraction and something called simultaneity. It's kind of interesting. Um, we got two planes here. Um, these are traveling, I don't know, really fast, like past the sea or something. And we are station, stationed where, where it looks like they're coming together, right? They're both traveling really fast, and, and they're going by each other. And we're right in the middle, and we're watching this. And we're watching for two events. Um, there's actually, this one's being flown by aliens, and this one's being flown by humans. And we're going to watch for two events. Um, we're watching for this alien pilot is giving a high five to his buddy that's hanging on the tail of the wind. That's one event. And then when they pass, they give each other a high five. Um, and then on this side, you've got a human pilot over here, and he's going to high-five to his buddy who's hanging on the tail of, of that wind. And I couldn't think of a better event than high-fives, so that's why we're doing high-fives. <laughs> now, to us, we see this, and they happen exactly the same time, because the front of this plane and the tail matches up, and um, the, the cockpit here matches up the tail. They happen at the same time, and to us, they both give high-fives at the same time. Um, now let's look at something, uh, another, another situation. Now, we are in a plane, now we're in a plane traveling next to this plane. We're in the same frame of reference as this bottom, bottom plane. So we're going alongside of it, and it looks like it's not moving. But what we see is we see this plane coming towards us, and now it looks like it's going twice as fast as in the previous example. And what's interesting is it looks much shorter. In fact, I don't know if you noticed, but this plane got longer. Now that, we're, now that it's at rest to us, it's at its normal length. It's at, it's at its full length, the, the longest that it would ever look. Um, but when things are moving, they're kind of contracted. So when we look at this, it looks contracted. Now when we watch for those same events, obviously, the first event that we see has to be this one. The human down here high fives the tail, the person up there. And then only when the plane moves further along, then do we notice that this pilot can, the alien can finally high five his friend. So in this situation, we notice the humans high five first. Okay, now you probably know what I'm gonna do this time. Now we're flying alongside the top plane going this way. And we look and we see this, planes compressed coming back. And what event do we see first? Well, now we see the aliens high five first, and then we see the humans high five second. Um, this is wild. Um, <laughs> so length contraction, contraction happens for all objects moving in a different frame of reference in the direction they're moving. They become length contracted. So that's crazy. So what this is saying is this is saying, where's my note? Um, oh, when one frame of reference, our first one, sees two events that are simultaneous, there cannot be another frame of reference that also sees the two events as simultaneous. There will be other observers around that will see them happening in different orders. There will only be one frame of reference that actually sees them as simultaneous. It happened to be the first frame of reference, that, the example that we looked at. But isn't it really simultaneous? Though? Didn't those really happen at the same time? Never say really in relativity. There's nothing special about our first frame of reference. There's no really about it. Um, so, so is everything in any order? What about cause and effect? Do some observers see my death before my birth? The answer is no. That's ridiculous. Only when two events, <laughs> only when two events are so far apart that light cannot travel between them. So, like this event, this, they were so far apart that light could not travel from here to here between the times that they that they both. Now, when you think about your, your, your death and birth, you'll probably die within a few thousand miles of your birth, okay? Well, light can definitely make it from where you're born to where you die in the amount of your lifespan. And that's why every observer in the universe will say, yes, you were definitely born before you died. Let's, that, that, that's probably not a weird, like, what was that? Let's, let's do it one more time. Earth and Mars, those, they are 11 light minutes apart. Let's say that two births happened a few minutes apart. They're a few minutes apart. Light doesn't have time to travel from the Earth to Mars in that time. So many observers in the universe will disagree on which birth happened first. And you can't say that really one of them happened before the other. You can't. Different observers will see the births happen in different, 
different orders. But if two births happened 12 minutes apart, more than 11 light minutes away, every observer in the universe will agree on which baby was born first. That's called simultaneity. Kind of go again towards the end here. So is everything relative? Is everything relative? No, of course not. In fact, relativity is about saying everything's relative. Here, relativity says what's not relative. Laws of physics are not relative. They're the same for every observer traveling uniform motion. Speed of light is not relative. It's the same speed for every, for everyone, for every observer in uniform motion. Closing remarks. GPS system. Is relative, does this theory even matter? Do we really need to know about this? GPS satellites, they travel around the Earth at 9,000 miles an hour. Because they're moving, Remember, even me walking, my clock is ticking slower than your clock. Well, if I was going 9,000 miles an hour, I have a GPS satellite. My clock is ticking significantly slower. In fact, GPS um, clocks, satellite clocks are ticking 7 microseconds slower than Earth clocks every day. That's important because they use those clocks to determine where you are on your phone. So, GPS, so the satellites, they have, they have to add 7 microseconds to their clocks every day to equal that out. That's special relativity. Um, if you're interested, we could later talk about general relativity, which talks, which is more about gravity and how time dilation happens with, based on not just speed or moving, but how close you are to gravity. Well, these satellites, they're further from the center of the Earth than we are. When you're closer to gravity, your clock uh, moves slower. So based on general relativity, our, the satellites' clocks are actually going faster, not slower. In fact, um, the effect is, that their, their clocks are going 45 microseconds faster than on Earth's. So they had to subtract, or they had to add 7 microseconds every day, but they had to subtract 45 seconds per day because of general relativity. Think about interstellar, when they land on the water planet, you know, and time goes really slow for them. That's like us on Earth compared to the satellites in the sky. So they have to, you know, 45 minus 7, they have to subtract 38 microseconds each day. Um, if they, if the people who build satellites, if they did not take into account special and general relativity, after two minutes, readings would be false. And each day, your location would be 10 kilometers off and growing by 10 kilometers every day. So it is kind of important to know. Um, and that's it. What if my birth on Earth caused <laughs> the baby on Mars to die? Oh, gosh. I guess that could happen. Then you would know. Then would you know if I was born before the baby oh. on Mars? Then you would know that you were within 11 minutes. I think if there's a ro there's a rover on Mars. Um, you can if you saw a boulder rolling towards it. Well, you're seeing that 11 minutes later. So if, if the boulder was going to crush the rover in five minutes, it's, it's already happened. It's already happened. So yes. Yeah, so if you um, for in order for information to travel, in order for you to have a cause and effect, it would it have to be within. outside the 11 minutes. Yeah, I've got a question for you. So um, I'm thinking back to the airplanes example that you had, right? With the simultaneous high fives. Yeah. And I and I guess maybe I'm just picking in the language here, but when you describe the situation as people high fiving simultaneously, um, I guess I'm wondering like which in which frame of reference were you seeing them as being simultaneous? Because the way you described it, uh, it, so it sounds like. In, on neither plane would it seem simultaneous to the passengers of the plane, right? You're right. Yeah. So the only so that on both planes, on one plane they're like, yeah, we high five first. On the other plane, they're like, no, we high five first. And you just happen to pick an external, like, planet watching that yep. made it seem like it was simultaneous. Is that correct? That's correct. And it's okay. not the position you are, but it's the position and the speed that you're moving. Okay. So the first example was I was in a position and in a place to where I was seeing both planes come at this at the same speed towards each other. In the other example, I was traveling, I couldn't have been at the same position with each other, but I was traveling alongside of it. Well, and that would be the same if you were in the plane, too. Same if you were, same if you were in the plane. Right? Yeah, if you're, yeah, the other two examples were as if you were in the plane. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Uh, that makes sense. Thank you. So what if I told you there's a phenomenon in quantum mechanics? <laughs> that, <laughs> I've listened to the quantum mechanics lecture three times, and I still don't understand it. That's why I chose to talk on special relativity. It's the easiest one of the three. Yeah. So, so you so, sorry. There's, I was going to say there's a, con there's a concept of retrocausality. 
that the explanation for the phenomenon that's happening is that the cause comes after the event. Oh, well, that doesn't <laughs> seem right. Explanation for it. doesn't um, seem right. That's the you, best explanation. You mentioned that um, you know, the, the, the results from these interesting experience, thought experiments and things um, happen when you're like uniform motion, right? Yeah. And you're talking about like the spaceship going to Mars or going to, the spaceship going to the star or whatever, right? Yeah. Um, that they can't look back on Earth and say, well, Earth is moving away from me. Right. And on you can. You can say, Earth is moving yeah. away from me, and it's moving back towards me. That's true. But, but in reality, yeah. Yeah, but like you, you say that, but, um, but you can't say that time is shorter for that, right? Is what you were saying, right? That right, because she stopped and turned around, and that changed everything. Changed now, even if she hadn't stopped and turned around, though, she still wouldn't be able to say that, uh, like... Right? I, I, I wanted to talk about this, but I mean, if, yeah, so those planes... Okay. If I'm moving like this, right, then my thoughts moving slower than you. Yeah. Slower than yours. But in my frame of reference, I maybe I'm going still, and you guys are all moving past, so your clocks are moving slower than mine. So you you, you can't really. Those are both true. Okay. So and, and <laughs> so, so, so you you can't compare them. You it, like you can't take those two clocks and compare without stopping and sinking back up in the same frame of reference again. There's so saying what they are in separate right terms of reference is kind of irrelevant. And it's how, yes, and it's how you measure, the, how, how would you determine that the other clock is running slower? Here's what you could do. You guys could have a clock here and a clock here. Yeah. And you can make sure that they're, they start at the same time. How do you do that? I could stand in the middle with two flashlights and say, when you, I'm going to shine a light in this direction, a light in this direction. When these clocks, when you see the light, set your clocks to 12 noon. Okay. Now these clocks are synchronized to this room's um, from reference. Okay. Yeah. Now, if I'm moving, and my then and like and then I have a clock here, and when I pass the clock, this one says 12:01 and this one says 12:01.000, and then I get to here, and then this person standing here says my clock now says 12:02, but this clock says 12:01 still. Yeah. So the, you guys are like, oh, obviously, you're moving slower. But what's interesting is for me. Um, I think you're moving slower, so it should be the opposite. Well, what happens is when I see when I see it to me, I'm say, I say, oh, well, those clocks were never synchronous to begin with because of the um, simultaneity. Simultaneity. It was simultaneously set in this frame of reference, but I'm moving, so I saw one of them be set to twelve exactly at one time, and I saw the other one get set to twelve o one late or twelve o'clock exactly later. They were never simultaneous, and that's how that works. Okay. Well, well what if I? Sorry, I hope you have that. Okay. Well, what, 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 what if I? Honestly, um, didn't mind melting at the same time. So, I'm loving or digging into stuff that I didn't have time to. So, so I, I um, so, right. So we, so, okay. Let's see if I can say this right. So we set set a clock, um, and we um, fired off in, in spaceship, right? Um, and the spaceship, after a while, though. Like it's it's only going to travel at like 0.8 c or whatever for a certain amount of time, and then it's scheduled to um, to stop, right? Yeah. Um, but it's not going to turn around and come back. But we're then it's just, it's just going to stop, and we're later going to then send like another um, an, um, another observer, another clock to go check on it, right? Yeah. Which is going to travel at a much slower speed, but eventually get there. So it's just the same, right? Yeah. Like, um, what am I going with this? Yeah, <laughs> I had the same There's thought. Still yeah, so one person stopped. If the second one took the exact same went the exact same speed and just happened to do it later, then they, they would be the same age when they yeah. will find it. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But if the first one goes slower, then then it'll take longer. Okay. But I guess where what I was thinking is I'm still thinking back on the comments on, um, so the, the from from the perspective of the first person, I, I'm still trying to wrap my head around the idea that. The first one sent out might think that time is moving slower. That time is moving slower for the place they left, for the planet they left. They right? think that, yeah. Um, even though, because the planet thinks that time is moving. S okay. All right. So Until the, someone stops, they both can say the other clock is moving slower. So it's not that they have to stop and come back; it's just that they have to stop. It's that they have to end up in the same frame. Change in acceleration, which stopping is yeah. a change in okay. acceleration. Yeah, okay. it's about 0.8 the speed of light 
is talking about the reference point being where you started. Yeah. You started on Earth, you're going point A the speed of light in relation to Earth. Relative to Earth. If yeah. the person on the spaceship, to them, they're not moving at all. I am moving is a pointless statement. Yeah. Unless you say, I am moving relative to this thing. So, so technically, okay, so let's go super crazy. Though. I don't have to stand up. Let's, 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 let's say that um, we, we launch a spaceship from Earth, it goes point A to C, um, but rather than stopping, so it's in the same reference as Earth again, somehow we accelerate Earth to to point A to C, so that uh -huh. now like, Earth is in the same frame of reference as sure. the ship that we sent out, yeah. right? Yeah. Like, what, hap who, what happens to time in that case? So, um, now they're in the same frame of reference, but Earth has experienced more time because they weren't traveling at point A to C for a certain amount of time. Yeah. So, th they, they will be, let's say they left five years later. Yeah. Um, they will be a little bit older, and if, to come together, some, one of them is going to have to speed up or slow down, and that's going to have time dilation effects, and you could do the math and figure out how old each person would be. But, but like, I mean, it would still be point A to C relative to something. I'm trying to think, there's got to be some, I mean, is, is there some way, even though if they're five light years apart, right, um, is there some way for them to interact without either one experiencing a change in acceleration? Oh, if they, if they yes, send, like, a yes, factor, yes, you can, you can communicate. The lecture, the professor in the lecture, he says that, now, what if they communicate with each other throughout this whole time? Yeah. You, they could still do that, and all he said was, and everything would work out. <laughs> okay. So uh, that's all I can say. I don't know. I, yeah, it, was just, it would all work out. And in fact, what I did that time, so I thought I was going to myself for this. I am um, with this, you know, how it goes up and then back down. And I used Pythagorean's theorem. Yeah. And I said, well, let's say that for me, I'm just counting this as one, two. In fact, I hit a slide. I actually had a photo of Jupiter and a giant holding a light clock the size of Jupiter. And I was like, this is going too much. You don't need to know the numbers. You just know what's going on. And I will do the numbers. If, 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 I, if, I, if this is the size of Jupiter, the diameter of Jupiter is half the speed of light. Like the, distance. the speed of light is 300,000 kilometers. Jupiter is about 150,000, so half that. So if you sent light to the other side of Jupiter, it would take half a second. And if you sent it back, it would take another half a second. Okay. So let's say this is the size of Jupiter. This is going, this is taking one second to go all the way up, or half a second to go all the way up, half all this. So I look at this, it's, it's quick talk, one second, each talk. Um, and now if I'm moving now, um, or maybe I was always moving sideways, but my frame of reference, it was always ticking at one. Now you're watching, you're seeing Jupiter and this clock travel by, and when you see it, it's, it's taking one and a half seconds. Taking one and a half seconds. So it's just that time, time, distance, whatever, that simple equation. Well now we know t, time, was, is 1.5. And um, light is traveling at speed of speed of light, and you can use Pythagorean's theorem to know um, this x distance, and so I can know how far you traveled. And if you know that distance, if you do distance divided by time gives you speed. I, you can calculate the speed at which Jupiter was going by. And I used Pythagorean's theorem in Excel, and in about three minutes, I had the answer, and I looked it up in the calculator online, and it was right. It's very simple math for special. Sweet. Thank you. A question. We're way over, but um, does it matter? We talk a lot about measuring time on, on all the different frames of reference. Does it matter what kind of clock you use? Like if it's a, a clock is anything that can measure time intervals. So uh, atoms decaying, like plutonium decaying or whatever, that's a clock. Um, and your watch use quartz crystals because they re they vibrate at a certain frequency. Uh, clock, there's nothing special. All clocks, your your body operates on speed. So like when you're traveling, everything, cells operate on some like speed. And um, and so time dilation has effects on everything. What if there's a giant clock that the bottom is on Earth and the top was on the satellite moving quickly enough to change something? Well, or I guess the bottom is in the center of the Earth. Ultimately, it's about the mechanism. How precise you want to be in time depends on you have to use a different mechanism to get more precise, which is why they were able to measure the, um, the gravity dilation of time uh, on those photons or from from uh, from the atmosphere down to the bottom, right? because gravity has, a, has an effect on that. The, they have to have a clock that is very very precise that has regular intervals at very very small amounts of time. And so when you talk about the arm being down there and up here. Ultimately, that's just an analog representation of what's happening in the middle of the clock. 
and the precision that you have at the middle of the clock, right? Yeah, so yeah. that's where it all comes down. At large scales, like information can only pass, travel at the speed of light. And so like if the sun ceases to exist, pretend there's like an arm that connects Earth to the sun, you know, and like that's what keeps it in orbit. Um, if the sun ceased to exist, what would the Earth's orbit look like? Would it immediately start going off in a straight direction? No, it would take eight minutes. The Earth would still rotate around the snow sun for eight minutes until the information had passed, till the gravitational field had evaporated. It would take eight minutes for that field to evaporate and then the Earth would stop doing things. So if you had a huge clock, maybe this is swinging down here, but it's not swinging like this. It'd be like this would swing and then this would swing and like, it would take minutes or hours for light to travel up and move things along. That's Information can't be you know, traveled. That reminds me of the thought experiment I've seen of like you have like a light year long pole and you like try and push the pole forward. Oh yeah. And it like it like contra ends up contracting Contracts. along the way, right? Yeah. 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 Um, yeah. There's another experiment with a with a with a meat, uh, yardstick. And if I had a yardstick and I was standing at a traffic light and the light is going here and I and I, the light comes off it, and I have a stopwatch, and I measure right when the light hits the front of the yardstick, and then it hits the back of the yardstick, and I stop it, I can do the distance divided by the time, and I can get the speed of light. Now what happens if someone's traveling a spaceship, half the speed of sea this way, and they've got a yardstick, <laughs> and they see the light coming, and they measure it, and then it gets to here, and they measure it, they'll still get the same, same speed, but at the same time, even though the light, I, I, when I saw it, it was like, wait, the light, what's going on? And it's because if I saw that yardstick, that yardstick would be compressed down to really small. And so the calculations would still work out. That's, that would be like a contraction. Okay. Yeah, all things, the other thing all you're things saying contract like, in, the, in the direction they're moving. Or, right now, my body's a little skinnier because I'm walking this direction. Well, well, I, I'm saying, saying, you would say like, if we had a, a bar for me to, to Dealey and I pushed it, the end it would be the, the so take the speed of light before he noticed that end move. Yeah. yeah. Well, I, 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 I could be completely off here, but I think the reason for that is that there's no such thing as a solid object, right? Is because it would take, like the atoms interacting with each other, yeah. the electronic yeah. force between the atoms that are holding them together would take... I think that's something right. totally different than um, yeah. speed of light and special relativity. I think now we're talking about something different. But that's kind of, I think, like what you were getting with the clock, right? Like it's this end of the clock moves, this end of the clock should also move at the same time. I forgot to say, like, what's interesting is you can't say I am moving. It's the same thing if you're on a point. You, you cannot tell that you are moving. There's no experiment to let you know that you're moving. If you're on a plane traveling 600 miles an hour and you didn't look out the window, mm -hmm. there's nothing, there's no experiment you could do to tell you that you're moving. It's because meaning, moving is meaningless. It's, you're only moving compared to something. Yeah, if you're, if you're saying moving in relation to Earth, there's you plenty of experiments. If, as long as you're moving in a, in, yeah, uh, in a straight line at a consistent speed. That's, what, that's what's called special relativity. Special means um, in the special case that you're moving in a straight line at a constant speed. Now the Earth is moving so slow that even though it's orbiting, it's basically a straight line. Um, just general relativity means, okay, what are the laws regardless of if you're moving in a straight line? Um, if, you're on, if you're on a plane you know, and there's no turbulence, it's fine. But if there's turbulence, you're accelerating. Now, now the ball doesn't act the way you expect it to work because it's not you're not in a special case in it, a special frame of reference anymore. Well, it also being close to the Earth confuses yeah. things because there's plenty of experiments to talk about your you counteracting gravity and then the motion related to that. Right? Gravity is really interesting because gravity turns out to like not really be a force. Like if you're falling, so like in a straight line, it's actually a straight line to what grab this to the space-time says, what gravity says. Like, special relativity, if, if, you're, if you're traveling, if you're falling towards Earth, you may be accelerating, but you're actually just following, you're, you're, fo you're following like the gravitational path. See, I'm not ready to, to talk about general relativity. Yeah, gravitational right? What's that? The, the warping of space, it's like the warping of space-time. Yeah, yeah general relativity is, all, is a story about gravity. So with acceleration, you're saying that someone's way out here accelerating away from Earth and they stop and they accelerate, decelerate to a stop. And that's what dilated uh, time and space dilation. That's what made the contraction. That's what made it different. Technically, to them, isn't Earth actually accelerating away from them also? 
No, accelerating is a change in speed. Turning the car, if you're driving at 60 miles an hour and you turn, and you're still going 60 miles an hour, you are accelerating because you're no longer going straight. Accelerating right. is a change. And so the Earth never changed direction or speed the whole entire time. But I feel like that's, that's semantically is still tricky because the whole time we're saying, People on Earth. I'm moving away from Earth, but they're saying, no, you're moving away from us. Until, before she stops, that's true. Before she stops, both their clocks are moving slower than relative to the other person's clock. Yeah. It's only when she comes to a stop which she, that she feels that acceleration. She comes to a stop. She, she's no longer in a frame of reference that where everything's all this are working. She comes to a stop. Everything is different at that point. But, but to actually move away from Earth, you're in, you, you are part of the frame of reference of Earth right now. Yeah. And for you to actually move away from Earth, then you're, you're the one that's changing your speed. Right, because... How, how, how come I couldn't just say, no, Earth is moving away from me? Uh, I mean, ultimately, that's he's right that you can't really say that, except for the fact that you are changing your reference. Right, the Earth has a, has a frame of reference right now that you are part of. And maybe the Earth is doing that too. Maybe you're continuing in that same frame of reference, but, uh, but one of those two has to change in order yeah. for it, there to be a difference. And right? it's not really the starting that's an issue. Like, if, someone, if your twin was flying by the speed of sea and then, or at 80%, and then right when they passed Earth, you were the same age or something, and so like the start, it's not about the start, it's about the stop. Like once you stop, now things are different. Like that, the twin feels a change. They feel a, an acceleration on them. Yeah. And that makes all the difference. Like, I, I'm trying to think of different way to say it, but like, that's it. Like, for, while they're traveling, there's no difference. They're in symmetry. They're both, you could say the other person's clock is moving slower because they are moving fast relative to me. But when she stops, she can't say, well, I, I, I'm still moving. My, I'm still in uniform motion. No, you're not. You're, you are no longer in uniform motion. Somebody has to change that. Yeah. That somebody has to change that frame of reference. Yeah. So and when that happens, it's the one who changes. You, the even she jumped out of the spaceship. Her spaceship kept going, and she stopped. So that's that's where the came in. And what if that Earth accelerated up to meet our frame? Of reference? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So I don't know if this is related or not, but I often hear like the universe is expanding. In these same contexts. Yeah. Yeah. Well, there's. That's why, like earlier, we've seen we've seen matter traveling away at 80% speed. Yeah. It doesn't look like a galaxy. 